Hi guys, um, I am just on my way to the train station because I'm going to Dead London in Dunleary today. Um, so I have to make my way to uh, the Dublin city and then I have to get a train from there on to Dunleary. Um, and I'm meeting my friend then at the next train station. So I'm really looking forward to today. It should be a good day. Um, I don't really know what to expect, but there's some really, really good riders. So I can't wait to just to see what's going to happen. Um, so I'm going to vlog some of the day and hopefully get some nice bits and pieces for you guys to watch. Um, so yeah. So we got some cool kind of goodies um, in a bag. So I got The Chalk Man by CJ Tudor. Um, Zara got another book so there's like different books in each bag obviously. And we got some like excerpts of books. Um, so this one is just a catalogue I think of some new thrillers coming out. And then this one is an excerpt of the new Jack Reacher thriller, which I actually haven't read, but I think Sarah has. Have you read them or your dad Jack has read Reacher, them? Jack Reacher, yeah. Yeah, a uh, cool little bookmark. That's actually really cute. Um, and then just another catalogue of books coming out, which is always fun to read. So this is the one that Sarah got in her bag, which actually sounds really, really good. So this is about people who stage their own murders and can then watch people react to their murders. It's kind of some kind of game. But then of course, someone actually dies, which normally happens in these situations. it's like a recruitment thing for the CAA or like a, your assignment. So it sounds like it's a recruitment thing for some kind of agency. Cool. Well, they sound pretty good. So we'll let you know if they are good. Um, so we're gonna go back in now in a few minutes and we will be able to see, I think Paula Hawkins is first. So that, will be re that should be really, really good. I haven't actually, read her latest novel but I read The Girl on the Train obviously and I did enjoy that one um, so I can't wait to see what she has to say. So I lived in Harare in, in Zimbabwe and as I say my, fa my father used to write what's called as a catchy occasionally for the Financial Times and people like that and we used to have a lot of journalists come and stay at the house and they'd been to exciting places and war zones and been kidnapped and all sorts which sounded very very glamorous to me so I decided that journalism was the thing for me. And um, <laughs> I had I had very romantic ideas, I think, of what I was going to be. I was going to be this staging foreign correspondent, or war correspondent, what have you. As it turned out, I didn't really have a temperament for it, and um, I ended up writing about tax and pensions. <laughs> and you wrote a book, actually, about a, a, a financial advice book for women. I did write a financial advice book for women, which I would, <laughs> I would suggest that no one ever read it. Um, <laughs> It, I wrote, it was published in 2004, um, so it was a different world, <laughs> it was very different times, um, the advice I, I'm pretty sure was terrible, so do not read that book. Um, a, a literary agent, a woman called Lizzie Kramer, who is my agent today, saw a column that I'd written and she had, she, it was actually her idea, this financial guide for women, and she called me up and said, oh, would you be interested in writing this? And I said, yeah, great, that sounds like fun, so I did that. And. Um, a few years later, she said to me, oh, uh, a publisher, she knew I was interested in writing fiction, but that I'd never actually actually got myself around to writing anything. And she, she contacted me and said, you know, there's this publisher, they want someone to write a kind of romantic comedy with, set against the backdrop of the recession. And, you know, you're a financial journalist, you understand this. Can you write a kind of ticket novel in eight weeks? Um, eight weeks. Yes, eight weeks. Um, <coughs> about a woman who loses her, you know, a woman who works in the city who loses her job. So I did, um, and I, did, I wrote that under a pseudonym, Amy Silva. Um, and it didn't set the world on fire, but it didn't do terrible, it didn't do that badly either. It was supposed to be writing romantic comedy, and but as I'd gone on, the books had got darker and darker, and more and more terrible things kept happening to it, all the characters. <laughs> and so this one also had, you know, it had a fatal car crash, and somebody dying of cancer, and all sorts of things that weren't, you don't really go to your romantic, romantic comedy for. <laughs> So it was more, I mean, it was, it was the wrong, it was all wrong. <laughs> um, romantic comedy was not my game, and I think that became very clear. So. And then you, 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 you morphed from Amy to Paula. Yeah, so I'd had this idea. I'd been toying with the idea of this character, this woman who um, has a drink problem and suffers from blackouts. And I tried to write a novel with her in it and kind of couldn't quite get it to work. But my agent kept saying, oh, the drunk girl, bring back the drunk girl, I like the drunk girl. So I had some other ideas and one of the things I've also been thinking about was the idea of somebody who witnesses something on her train commute, just a flash of a, you know, an image. And that my original idea had been that she would witness an act of violence or something, but I, I, I changed that. But in, in any case, it was, it was the, the, you know, the, 
the connection of those two ideas. When I put the drunk girl on the train, that was when it was like, oh yeah, now I can see there's so much you could do with this, with her perception, with her memory loss, with her unreliability. And then it sort of opened up. So so that was, yeah, that was the genesis of it. And did you feel as you were writing that, that, ha, I've cracked it? Well, it was certainly, it was a huge relief to be writing that, to not be trying to shoehorn myself into a, into a romance storyline, which I've never, I don't really do happy endings, it's not my thing. Um, I'm not super romantic. So it, that was a relief. I thought Rachel's voice was just right from the start. So we just got to see uh, Paula Hawkins speak, and that was really good. <laughs> so Paula Hawkins was really, really good. I got to film some of it, and then I got given out to for filming, um, but hopefully I explained that I was what I was doing, and hopefully I'll be able to film more of the day, but I don't know, so maybe that might be all you see, but um, I'll get back to you about that. Um, but Paula Hawkins was really good. Um, she, I never knew that she had written under a pseudonym before. She wrote some kind of... Uh, chiclet books or adult contemporary as we say now um, under a pseudonym and yeah so that was really really interesting and she said that there will probably be no sequel to Girl on the Train which isn't surprising because I wouldn't think that that needed a sequel um, but they were asking about that so she says no the story is finished for her and she's also talking about some of the kind of movie options for um, In the Water uh, that was pretty interesting and she's also saying that she's working on her third book. She has a few ideas but she hasn't really written anything down yet. Um, but she has some ideas uh, floating around in her head so that will be interesting to see what she comes up with next. Um, so next we're going to see, I think it's Benjamin Black and Stuart Neville, I think. Um, so they should be pretty interesting. I read one of Stuart Neville's books there a couple of weeks ago, which was under a pseudonym of Hale and Beck, which was here and gone, and that was really, really good. So I'm interested to see what he has to say, and I will try and film that, but I don't know if I'll be allowed to, but I'll try, and I will get back to you. So I'm going to be able to film, and um, they just moved us back to like one of the last rows. Because uh, just, just us, we're just like the only people in the back, so <laughs> just, just so obviously the filming wouldn't disturb anyone, which is fine because I have Zoom, so um, hopefully the sound will still be okay. And I'm always intrigued about people writing the pen names. Um, because you're writing basically as another person, um, do you assume the person's personality when you're writing? Do you do anything differently? Do you do you use different uh, tools? Do you dress different people? Is that, is that something you do? Is that John is writing as Benjamin was doing different people? Oh, well, when I conceived this mad idea in the first place, I, I found me dexterous, so I thought that I would write. <laughs> <laughs> it's curious, I constantly confuse Benjamin Black with the character Quirk. Um, so obviously, Benjamin Black is a character that I've invented to write books for. Um, I don't see him, I uh, know vision of him. Um, he's obviously taller than I am, younger and too handsome. Uh, attractive to women and all that. But, um, no, I don't, I don't see him. But then I don't, I don't see John Bandle either. Uh, the person who writes ceases to exist when I stand up from the desk, whether it's Bandle or Black. Writing is Hayward Beck. Um, How is that? I mean, do you have to assume some different personality? Does, does that mean something to you? Sure. It's nothing as lofty yeah. as that, really, to be honest. It's the only thing I have to do really is is kind of adopt an American accent. Really, something that that's the key distinction between the Hill and Back books and books under my own name um, is that they're set in America. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's kind of uh, uh, my accent moves west, basically. Um, but even that isn't isn't that difficult. Um, I still sort of find it difficult, I think, is in that it's, uh, I grew up in Starsky and Hutch and, you know, the air team and all those sort of American shows I watched as a kid and American cinema and American, but you know, most of the crime fiction I read, I was like, I know that it was American crime fiction, so it's, it's um, not that usually for me to adopt that voice, but that's really all it is, there's no kind of, I don't have special going back slippers that I wear. <laughs> it's interesting, it's interesting to do that. Uh to adopt an American accent, you have to remember to call the, the boot of the guard the trunk. You have yeah. to remember to call the lift the elevator. You know. but, uh, I remember when Andrew Davis was doing his television scripts for the Benjamin Black book the BBC. <laughs> he used to phone me up and say things like, when somebody says, is this yourself? <laughs> <laughs> what do they mean exactly? <laughs> <laughs> 
And I didn't realize that there was so much of it that must baffle yeah. foreign readers. Is it yourself? And I'm sure you say, oh, Benjamin Black is true. Going over the Bangle territory is asking a deeply uh, existential <laughs> question. <laughs> is it yourself or is it <laughs> But Chandler was a great revelation to me. Chandler suddenly here was an entirely different voice, uh, very stylish, uh, very cool, very uh, very beautiful. <coughs> I mean, he's written some, some beautiful paragraphs, and also funny. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very very difficult. If you find this very difficult to have humor in a crime book, I'm not sure why. Um, you do, don't seem to, don't seem to, to, to allow of each other. Um, so I, I, I think it was a big revelation to me that what right stylish did. So I, I don't, I don't have maybe the separation that you do, John, between one identity and the other, because it's kind of, it's just a slightly different flavour of the same thing, mm. if that makes sense. That um, might change, though, because I know John talked about this in an art club documentary many years ago, where over, the, yeah, over time it, the, the relationship kind of changes, doesn't it? The relationship between... It's between you and, and Benjamin, John Bamel, I should say, and uh, Benjamin Black. I suppose it has. I mean, this this latest one, the, the Pride Nights, mm. Nights, is set in the car around 1600. And that's... I used a lot of the uh, research that I'd done for my novel Kepler mm -hmm. many, many years ago. Um, so there was a kind of, it was harder to write that one because of that. There was a kind of crossover, mm -hmm. which when I was halfway through the damn book, I realized it was a dreadful mistake. So <coughs> what happened then? I mean, did you? I just had to keep going at it, and I was about six months over the deadline. Uh, which is unheard of for me. Yes. Um, and one reviewer of this book of Pride Night said that this could mark the ending of the bifurcation of uh, John Bamble and uh, Benjamin Black. This could be actually coming to the end of it. Amazing. Is that possible? Amazing <laughs> that a reviewer should be wrong. Well, for often all the people think an awful lot about our books than we do sometimes, I think. With a couple of exceptions, I think all my books mean something like that. There's been one question posed and then the, the story evolved sort of extrapolates from figuring out what the answer to this. And you've actually um, finished the first treatment, treatment of the second Hagen Beck novel just last week, actually working in revisions at the moment. Um, it's a standalone thriller, again, set in New York City, I believe, different locale. Yeah. Can you tell us anything else about it? Or? I haven't quite refined my elevator pitch for this, but okay. it's, it's um, the working title at the minute is for We Are Many. Um, but it's uh, it's a woman called Casey McKenna who's a sort of tech entrepreneur in New York, mm. has built a very successful business, single mother, and um, as it tends to be the way she's she's active online blogs and so on, and, but is constantly trolled by sort of alt right and men's rights activists, the kind of thing we see online today, mm. far all too much, and she um, but she gives an interview to a magazine and makes an offhand quip that really offends uh, a hacking group, so they go after. Her. But uh, it's more extreme than she's used to, but it starts to spill into the real world. Uh, it's about what happens when that kind of online hate is removed onto the streets instead of just being on the screen. Mm -hmm. Was it easier the second time around writing a Taylor Beck? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was not to go to write right? this one. Yeah. Um, I think I, 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 I kind of knew this already, but my one constant is I have to know how it's going to end, I have to know what the last scene's going to be, okay. so that everything falls in that direction. Um, I, mean, I don't plan anything all than what the last scene is going to be. And this book I didn't have it. And it was like literally last week I figured out what it was and then the rest of the book just kind of read it like 7,000 words in one day. I like to, to let them drift. They seem to me, the older I get the more writing seems to me to be a dreamlike process. Uh, and the next event in black, the one I'm doing, which I've started now, which I'm looking forward to, it's, a, it's an erotic ghost story set in Venice in the winter of 1900. And I have a great fun with that. Uh, I've always wanted to write an erotic book. Uh, and I've always wanted to write a ghost story. So I combined the two. Is it a dead body at this time, or do you have a corpse? As a disappearance, again. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, there is a dead body, yes. Mm. Yeah. So not that way. But that there are living bodies as well, which are more interesting. Shit, nachos, break, smile. The first thing I ever uh, had sort of published or broadcast was a piece for Sunday the Sunday. And then I wrote, um, I was commissioned to write a six part animation series for T.G. Carter. 
and I had a day job working in Fair City, but on the sort of administration side, not really on, on the writing side of that. And um, then I wrote some short stories for the Francis McManus competition, and one of those was shortlisted. And the, the, the story that was shortlisted was the first chapter of Unraveling Oliver. So I developed that short story into Unraveling Oliver. It became a book. And I, I think when you're you're describing, you know, the various stages went through, I think that would be a lot familiar to people because a lot of people enter those competitions. Yeah. You know, can the script. So you were well, experimenting, yeah. <coughs> and every little thing you get gives you encouragement to go on. Or you know, is that? Uh, yeah, I think so too. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you get knocked back, if you get rejected, but I was just really lucky. Like the first thing I submitted to Sunday was Sunday was broadcast, and if it hadn't. I wouldn't have written another one. Would you not? Me? No, I don't think so. So you did. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't have you know, a pile of manuscripts under the bed that you thought, oh, I'll just no, dust all this off now. No, and in fact, you know, anything that I had that didn't get broadcast or didn't get used has ended up being used in a different way. Okay. Uh, so, it, so really, that book kind of began with more France, really, mm. and then <coughs> the characters come very quickly after that. Yeah. It's obviously. The novels, you know, are people, so yeah. you have to have a cast of characters, and and they are very character-driven novels, I would say. But I do think that the start is always more than the novel of the grand pen. In a way, a big step for you, isn't it? Because having written so many uh, books with uh, Tempe Brennan at the center, it's yeah. a brand new character. It is. It's completely different character, different setting, different premise. What happened? My publisher actually suggested it, trying an off-series uh, book, and I, at first I had, I thought, no, why do I want to do that? I'll just do another Tempe. But the more I thought about it, the more I was thinking about it, and the more I was thinking about the fact that I was thinking about it, and I realized I was creating a character already. So, off we went. Because Tempe Brennan is a forensic psychologist. Anthropologist. I thought that was but anthropologist. <laughs> Li living in Carolina, um, who um, helps out or is involved with uh, various crime scenes. And all those things are basically exactly the same as you. Yes, she lives in the Carolinas and she works there and also in the <coughs> Quebec, the province of Quebec in Canada. I remember when the first book came out, and my character does that, and the reviewer said, that's ridiculous, nobody could live in the Carolinas and commute to Quebec, and I said, well, I do that, so. Drew me into forensic. Initially, I trained to do bioarchaeology. In the US, archaeology is a subspecialty within anthropology, because anthropologists study humans, and archaeologists are studying ancient humans and trying to reconstruct culture. So, but my mind, it really prefers the physical hard sciences. I'm kind of like Tempe on TV. She's a little disparaging of <laughs> psychology and some of the softer sciences. I have to be able to see it and photograph it and measurement. And bones do that for me. But bones are, so that's my specialty. It's osteology, the human skeleton. But bones are also a person. So it brings in the humanity. It brings the two of those things together as well. I'm not very good at short, so I wrote uh, four short stories, and they're now in a, a book called The Bone Collection. And one of those is an origin story. It's called First Bones. And it's Tempe's origin story, and it tells how she's in her lab one day, and the police, because she's the bones lady out at the university, she's working happily on her ancient skeletons. The police come to her, and they have a very modern skeleton, and they ask if she would look at it. And that's how she gets drawn from archaeology into forensics, and that's exactly how I got drawn. Exactly the same way. Yes, yes, cops. It was way before we had board certification and more formalized means of determining who legitimate experts are. Um, so yeah. was this a specific case where the officers investigating it realized that they needed this particular expertise and came searching around to yeah. pick up the phone to you? Yeah. I wrote a partial manuscript, um, it was about 200 pages, I guess, and I printed it out and I read it and it was really slow and it was really boring. So I abandoned that. It was the Temperance Brennan character, but it was in third person voice. So I abandoned that, I started over, um, and I switched to first person voice. And then it was like I was telling my own story through Tempe, and that worked for me. <laughs> yeah, so it took two years and then I, yeah. So you switched to the first the first person voice of Tempe Brown, and it strikes me even listening to you here now, the first 
first-person voice or time around is not that different from your first-person first person voice, is it? Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, it's different from Emily Deschanel, who plays Tempe Brennan yeah. on television, but um, shes I hear her in my head, so I'm yeah. hearing my own voice, I'm sure, and I'm told we have exactly the same sense of humor. Yeah, well, I guess you've got a yeah, good sardonic yeah, sense of humor. Fighting, yeah, fighting, um, yeah. I'm kind of guessing you wouldn't take too much crap about being yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Here's a fun thing. Um, I, I, wrote a straight, uh, I wrote a short story which just appeared in an anthology called Match Up with Lee Child. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. And we brought Temperance Brennan together with Jack Reacher in yeah. the story. So... <laughs> How did they get on? Uh, they, got, they got on really well. <laughs>